Real people, real celebrities, real talk. Join the Breakfast Club. Weekday morning, 6 to 10. Morning, everybody. It's DJ MV Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club, and we got a special guest with us this morning from the book. What's the name of the book, Yee? Ah, oh, Sister Soldier, a moment of silence. A moment of this silence. This is a midnight Sister Soldier. Three. Good morning. Yeah, it's like her fourth, right? This yeah. is my sixth book. Six, yeah, Woo. yeah. I remember Coldest Winter Ever is the one everybody really Co- loved. Uh, it's No Disrespect was mm-hmm. my first book. That's mm-hmm. nonfiction. Mm-hmm. The Coldest Winter Ever was the one that, you know, sold millions of copies. That everybody's and, waiting for the movie from. Yes, and we'll talk about that. And <laughs> uh, Midnight, A Gangster Love Story, was uh, number seven on the New York Times bestsellers list. Mm-hmm. And then there was um, A Deeper Love Inside, right. The Poor Santiago Story. Mm-hmm. And then another Midnight book, Midnight and the Meaning of Love. Mm-hmm. And now we have. A moment of silence. I put that up on my Instagram and people started going crazy. Like, this book is out already. Oh, I got to go get my book. You know, so on and so forth. So I was excited when I got this book in the middle. I was like, okay, I know what I'm doing this weekend. (laughs) Listen, I I am so grateful for the reaction that people have had to the writing and uh, the story in the book. And uh, a girl told me, your books are like crack, sister soldier. (laughs) 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 And I looked on the internet and... um, I saw somebody trying to sell an advanced copy of my book Ooh. for nine hundred dollars. Wow! <laughs> I said, "Wait a minute! <laughs> you need it. I need pieces. <laughs> I need to understand that because if there's somebody who's going to pay that kind of money, I need to uh, up my whole game and marketing strategy and everything else. Right. You write Wait. yourself and everything. Oh yeah, or... yeah. Uh, that's the thing about writing. It's a uh, um, very personal. It's mm-hmm. just me. My my pad and my pen. Right. I write old school with the um, ink and paper. I don't type from my imagination into a laptop or mm-hmm. iPad or anything. So like then that. someone types it for you after. Well, uh, it's a combination. Myself and my nieces. Oh, <laughs> my nieces nice. helped me to type up the manuscript to turn it into the book company. Now, I always wonder, how do you get in the, the mind of a okay, man okay, yeah. like Midnight? You know, like how did... Because reading the book, it really seems like it's written from... You know, this male perspective. Yeah, this male perspective and all these things about honor and everything. I'm like, how does she get into a mind of that character? Well, I've had a pretty interesting life. You know, I was born in the Bronx and raised in the projects the earlier part of my life. Then uh, my family moved out to Jersey with my grandmother. The suburbs. But I have been surrounded by men my whole life, you know, mm-hmm. um, not in a more in an activism way, you know. So I've always been curious about the condition of our people. And I was the type of young lady who would walk up to a brother on the street and ask him, you know, how did you get here? and Why are you doing it this way? And mm-hmm. aren't you worried about the consequence of this or that? And so I've had a lot of conversations with brothers in the hood and uh, people in organization, brothers in college, uh, university level. So, you know, I just am familiar Right. I always say that I don't write uh, from a distance. I'm going to give you a book that is a thriller that's written in a language you can understand. I'm not trying to impress you. I'm not trying to speak over your head or use some SAT words or some crazy mm-hmm. kind of language. I'm going to speak in our language, but I'm going to write it beautifully so that it can connect with your, you know, things that are familiar to you and, and, and things that will move your soul. How do you know this was your calling as a child? Because, I mean, you grew up in the Bronx, and during the time you grew up, hip-hop was getting big, graffiti was big. Yeah, why not rap? Yeah, why not yes. something else? I thought uh, you were a rapper at one point. Well, actually, you know, I had my um, my days in hip-hop, of course. You know, we all did. And like I said, I come from the Bronx, but I started writing uh, letters to my mother when I was young. Because my mother used to say, uh, you have a, a powerful voice. You got to watch your tone of voice. And if you use the wrong tone of voice, you know, you might get that back slap. My wife says that to me. I'm going to start writing letters to her now. <laughs> and you don't have no powerful That's, voice. My mama so, used to say that in a nicer way. She said, you, you don't know how to talk to nobody. <laughs> <laughs> you still don't. Yeah. Right. Well, my mother, you know, so she said, you know, you have to, you have to speak correctly. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, when I was a little girl, I'd be in my room and I'd think, Uh, Does she mean I'm saying something that's not correct 
or she's saying that I'm saying something that's true, so that's making her angry. Mm -hmm. And then I just figured out, you know what? If I write it down, mm -hmm. I can't get in trouble for it. Mm. I can't get in trouble for my tone of voice. Right. So I would write her a letter and say, Ma, you know, <laughs> And sometimes it would be about something controversial, like you don't like your mother's new boyfriend right. or, you know, uh, in my case, I didn't like cigarette smoke. And so, you know, she was a smoker and I felt like she should smoke in her room and she felt like she paid the rent. So uh, I should go to my room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So, you know, I would write a letter about it, you know, what I thought about it, what my opinions were. Mm. And then after that, once I got into school, I started working for the school newspapers. So right. I've always been a writer. Even at Rutgers University, I wrote for the paper. That's interesting to me because as a, a kid, I used to write everything all the time, too. I went mm -hmm. to I was an English major in school and I did a lot of writing. And every time I got mad at my parents because I couldn't say certain things to them, I would write. That's right. A story about it. But listen, I want to say that also I took some screenshots of uh, parts of the book that I thought were interesting okay. so far because I'm only on page 180. She checked uh, <laughs> to see where I was at. But I do feel like reading about this character should inspire some people to want to do a little better right. in life. The character of um, of Midnight. Now, one part I screenshot. Let's see. Uh, he talks about an army of believing men. OK. And he talks about inspiring other men to become believers who are not perfect, but who are humbled and striving. It's a starting point of building an army of men, not just a band of N-words or a gang of fools or a heap of heedless heathens. And he talks about being in jail and uh, not having that that army of people that he needs, you know, right. to, to show him support. So it feels like while Midnight was out in these streets, a lot of stuff he was doing on his own, moving mm. on his own, not letting anybody know right. what he had going on. But then it also seems like he felt like he did need to have some type of support system. And how do people find that? Well, I think sometimes uh, brothers don't think about brotherhood mm. until they cuffed and chained to the next man. Mm. So when he found himself in the court, you know, uh, in the tombs and they brought him up for the, you know, for the court case, he was cuffed. His, his, his ankles were cuffed, his wrists were cuffed and the chain connected him to the next man who was cuffed and chained. And he said there was 11 of them in a row, all cuffed and chained. So it was no way for him to even think of himself as an individual at that point anymore. If somebody yanks the chain, you got to move in one direction. Mm -hmm. If somebody, you know, falls down, then everybody, you know, is going to feel the weight of that. So I think that he began to, to think higher on a higher level than just an individual once he got involved in the criminal in the in the so-called justice. System. A lot of people do that for protection, too, in jail, though. They right. want to click up. Let me get with this gang or this gang over here just so they can have somebody to have their back in case something goes down. Right. Well, it's a dreadful situation. Incarceration is a dreadful situation. Enslavement is a dreadful situation. Whenever I see cuffs or chains, mm -hmm. shackles or anything like that, it gives me a very uh, dark, serious, uh, very sad feeling. Uh, the thing about this book, I'm, I just call it pure thunder. This is like the main vein to the streets. It's what uh, too many young uh, African-American and Latino uh, men in our communities all across the entire nation are going through. So this is very, very close to the people. Uh, the reason why I called it a moment of silence is because this has become so regular for us. Getting locked up has mm -hmm. become so regular for us. Even our culture in hip hop, a lot of it comes from the prison system. The language we use, the way that we walk, the way that we talk, not wearing a belt, your pants sagging, all of that stuff comes from the prison system. Right. Uh, I heard y'all uh, uh, having some toss the salad kind of conversation oh, on the breakfast. Oh, that's from the prison system. On the system. breakfast club. That's from the prison yep. system. So oh, that's even started in prison? Uh a lot of things happen in prison because it is an artificial, unnatural environment. Mm. So if you're a young man and you get incarcerated by the time you're 11 or 12 years old, you're in juvie. You're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. You have spent the majority of your life in a all-male environment. Mm -hmm. And this is a very serious thing and it has a very heavy psychological impact and it's something that the medical professionals, the psychiatrists are not helping our community with because it's particular to our community that the numbers are so high mm -hmm. of our men being imprisoned for a long period of their lives or being on parole uh, or just being supervised by the court. They say at least 25 percent 
of our men are in constant supervision or incarceration under the uh, court system. You know, let the record show. I did a year in jail, but I didn't get my booty ate in jail. All right, I got it ate in the street. But let me ask you a question. question. How do we get these young African-American and young minorities to read more? When I was a child, and I know Charlemagne's moms is a teacher, we had to read. There was stuff Damn on the right. curriculum where you had to read. But now on my kids' curriculum, I have four kids, they're, they're minimal reading. I mean, it's uh, Bring back the book it program. You know what I mean? Right. It, it's, and they don't have to read, so they don't read. And it just seems like... Even if we didn't read, there was encyclopedias, there was dictionaries, but now everything is Google. You have to think about what is the reason for that, you know. To whose benefit does it serve for your children to be ignorant, mm -hmm. you know. I think that uh, people are being herded into just entertainment, not intellectual development or cultural evolution. How do we get them to read? For, for me, in the projects, my mother used to read children's stories to me all the time. Mm -hmm. I fell in love with the rhythm of her voice. I fell in love with the storytelling itself. So a lot of times when you're a parent, if you have small children, you should read to them. They'll fall in love with the characters. And then what will happen is you get them their New York Public Library card, and when they go into the library, they get to cultivate their own taste, choose the books that they actually like, and then they grow up in the culture of reading. But if they never saw their father read a book and they never saw their mother read a book, they're not going to read a book. If the whole family is revolving around the television and the television is on, you know, 24-7, then that's not going to be a child who's interested in literacy. There's nothing more fun to me than being at home when I have like a day or some time to unwind and to sit down and read a book. It's like a very peaceful, that's excellent. different type of feeling. And I want to say from the title, Moment of Silence, just from reading what I read so far, it feels like um, Midnight Silence is very powerful. Mm. Yes. In this book. And, you Absolutely. know, it's pretty early in the beginning, but he does go to jail and he doesn't say a word like when he's getting arrested. They're questioning him. Everybody's asking him. They're trying to get him to confess. They're trying to get him to be a snitch and all of that. Right. And he is just silent. And that makes people angrier. Right. He it notices that that makes people angry. The fact that he has mastered his own ability to be silent. He thinks that that's uh, uh, difficult for people in America that America is a place where people are just always talking, even when there's nothing important to say or use or useful to discuss. Just a lot of foolish uh, uh, chatter, which he associates with femininity, mm -hmm. you know. So he thinks that uh, a man uh, would be more silent and more thoughtful because a man has to uh, lead a family uh, to a safe place, you know, hopefully. And so you have to plan and you have to follow through with your plans and you have to observe. So when he gets into any environment, he's trying to study who's who and, and what's what. The same way you would when you first move into the hood. You need to know mm -hmm. who's who and what's what. Mm -hmm. Who's guarding the bench? Who's guarding the door? Who's going to take your money when you're on the way to the store when you're supposed to get the groceries and bring them back to your mother? You know, what's happening at the back door, the front door, the side door? He he thinks uh, strategically and uh that's uh, something I recall when I when I grew up, just men having to do that. I had an older brother. He had to make sure that I was safe and make sure that I get to where I'm going mm -hmm. and make sure everything that we left the house with stays in our pocket and doesn't end up with somebody else. Now, how did you link up with Public Enemy back in the day? Uh, let me see. Okay, well, I was, I was working with uh, homeless children in New York. They had these welfare hotels, and they had... Uh, 1,500 families in one hotel. It was really crazy. So they had all these homeless children. And so I was organizing the homeless children. And a lot of people in New York were familiar with me because they'd see me on a train with like 20 kids, 30 kids. <laughs> they'd see me in a restaurant. I'd take them up to Sylvia's mm -hmm. and be like, this is my crew. You know, let's try to, you know, get them something to eat. So I became popular, well-known for my activism. And Chuck D uh, said that I was living the life that he was rhyming about. Mm -hmm. And um, we started then uh, speaking at universities mm -hmm. and colleges together. And then eventually uh, he asked me, did I want to be a part of, of PE? And uh, gave me some kind of titles. <laughs> 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 Called me a raptivist, the sister of instruction, mm -hmm. the minister of information, like all kind of <laughs> titles and things. But really I was just uh, a young African woman, you know, that was just trying to uh, live positively and care about everybody else in the community and everybody else's children because I was 
didn't even have, you know, any children at that did, point. Did you, act, you, did you rap or was it more like spoken word? Uh, did I rap? I rapped, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I rhymed or spit or whatever you want to call it. But my heart is in the word. Gotcha. You know, my heart is in the word, in, in, speaking, in speaking the words, in meaning what I say, in writing the words. That's where my, my heart is. And I think what he was trying to capture uh, on 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 wax or on CD at that time was the feeling of Sister Soldier, the voice, and I think my feelings, you know, came very strongly through my voice. Did you realize um, how strong your voice was? Like your mom told you when you made the comments <laughs> to the Washington Post. When you said, if black people kill black people every day, why not have a week and kill white people? Almost everybody black knows I didn't say that, Charlamagne. So, you so didn't I'm say surprised that. that you missed the boat. <laughs> no, of Sometimes I didn't Google say that. doesn't work. No, th- that's. So, uh, so you was misquoted or they just lied? Uh, or? I, I think it was more uh, a very highly uh, orchestrated political uh, move that was made uh, where I was just being used mm-hmm. primarily uh, to attack hip hop to make it seem like the people who care about the black community are the actual racists and not the system that promotes racism mm. are the actual racists. And it goes way back, you know, to the time of slavery. I, I don't want to bore you all, but I'm a historian. It's not boring. You know, in, uh, on the plantation, uh, the slave who knew that they weren't really supposed to be a slave and wanted to fight against slavery and wanted to organize the other slaves on the plantation was always the one that they point out, that they string up, that they hang, that they cut off your foot or your uh, chop off your tongue or, you know, just choke you to death. So I, I think of it metaphorically the same way. At that time, I was young. I had the powerful voice. I had the love of the people and I love the people. I organized summer camps. I organized homeless children. I did, everything that I did was just good. And you'd mm-hmm. have to be like a real devil right. to not see that. And so they took me for being the strong, uh, powerful, um, outspoken woman who was inspiring everyone else to get rid of their slave mentality and slave existence. Mm. And they tried to put me in the hairs of the target, like how Chuck D has the man in the, in the right, target. Right. They tried to put me there. But at that time, I defended myself. And I think that they saw something that was their biggest nightmare. That, oh no, this young lady is somebody who can speak on the same level as you who can put you in check, who can talk about politics and finance and international and global warfare and all of these issues um, unapologetically. Mm -hmm. So when they chose me to be the one that they would hang, I think they were uh, really shocked that uh, my resistance was was very uh, strong. Now, Bill Clinton responded. Was there a quote at all? Bill Clinton responded. His campaign responded to what you said, correct? Bill Clinton was trying to discipline Jesse Jackson at the time, mm-hmm. you know, because they thought Jesse Jackson was out of order, too. Right. <laughs> and you were, you were a member of the Rainbow Coalition? No, you, you I wasn't weren't? a member. Okay. Jesse Jackson invited me to speak at that time, and Bill Clinton was on the ticket after me. And so when Bill Clinton spoke, he uh, uh, admonished or told Jesse, you should not have had her. You should have not ha- have had Sister Soldier here. How does that make you feel about Hillary now? Would you vote for Hillary? Would you support Hillary? It all goes back to the plantation, my brother. Mm. You know, you got the, the white master and his wife. Mm. And, you know, they talk down to black people. They talk down to black people, which doesn't mean they haven't done anything good for black people. But there were some kind slave masters also. But they're still slave masters. Mm-hmm. And they still think of you as slaves. So when I think of things, I think of it metaphorically related to the plantation. You know, I say, oh, well, Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, she worked for Obama and she even talked down to Obama, the commander in chief, while she was under his command. Mm. So I thought to myself, well, you know, a slave master would have no problem 
with uh, the slaves because they're doing what they're told. But for somebody like President Obama and his wife, both graduates of Harvard, uh, you can't talk down to them. Mm -hmm. And so if you do, it probably means that, you know, something you're you're telling on yourself. If you can't get along with the person that you work for and you're talking down to the commander in chief when you work for him, Mm -hmm. uh, that tells me something about you that kind of rubs me the wrong way. Was there a quote that got misconstrued or they just made up everything just to hang you? Um, I'm going to say it like this. Um, I speak very clearly uh, and very precisely. So I don't think things get messed up when I talk. I think I say it the right way and then you can do something with it if you want. I mean, we're living in the Photoshop digital era, yes, so you can, you can chop anything up the way that you want, and right. you can label somebody um, and try to twist somebody's character. But the fact of the matter is um, I'm sister soldier, uh, lover of the people, and not just all talk, somebody that organizes and builds and teaches who has patience with the children and love from the community. So, yeah, that was their game they were playing, but I wasn't playing. Now, what about making some of your books into a movie? I know yeah, now we got to get into that. Yes, yes. Because we've been happen. waiting for this to happen. It seemed like it was about to happen. I know Jada Pinkett Smith was on board. What mm. ended up happening? Okay, so that with Jada, that was back in the day. Okay, so what happened was Jada was amped on the coldest with the ever. She loved it, loved it, loved it. And so she was like, let's make a movie and not waste any time with it. We made a deal Mm. with HBO. And um, in the deal, she was the executive producer, and so was I. Mm -hmm. And I was the writer of the screenplay, which I wrote the script. And uh, it was all good. And then the administration over at HBO changed. Mm -hmm. And the new person came in and said, I'm not not making that movie. Wow. (laughs) And so I said, okay, but wait a minute. I sold the rights to HBO to make the movie. So I said, give it back. If you're not going to make it, then right. give it back. And they said, well, this is going to cost you. And then they quoted me a price. What? You know, like the price of buying a house. And I went right to my bank account and took the money out okay. and bought my sh- back. There you go. There we go. There you go. <laughs> there you go. That's, That's boss talk right there. <laughs> yeah, because they thought I went out and bought a gold chain or something or did something. I have like, you like, I have it. Give me my, my stuff the, back. Give me, my, give me everything back. So Was I the number the of Emma better? Was the number a million or better? Uh, I I don't want to comment on the number, but <laughs> <laughs> you got all it I, back. All I'm gonna say is I got it back, and it was house money. Okay, you so know? now what? So now what? Now the the coldest winter ever has been optioned again. Mm-hmm. Present day, script 2000. is done, ready to go. Script is done, ready to to go, and we are working on organizing the financing because it's independently mm. uh, produced, mm. uh, but it's. Uh, around a $15 million film. So uh, it's going to be a high quality uh, production. We're not trying to make no, you know. Having it independently produced is probably better because you'll get so much more control over it creatively and I'm sure make a whole lot more money. Absolutely. Uh, The investors stand to make a whole lot of money. We look at some of the other successes that have gone Mm -hmm. on coming out of the hip hop community. So they stand to make a, a great deal of money. Uh, But for me, it's not the money so much as it's the uh, controlling the creativity of it. I don't want anybody to twist my characters the way they tried to twist the real sister soldier in the in the political media. Mm -hmm. So I want my characters to stay the way I wrote them. Are you fans of any other writers out there now? Any young writers? Are you fans of any writers? Fans of writers. You know what? Um, I read a lot of nonfiction. Mm-hmm. People ask me this question all the time about am I fans of other writers, but I don't read too much fiction, fi- uh, fiction mm-hmm. even though I write fiction. Mm-hmm. So the last uh, nonfiction book that I read was the Mike Tyson uh, autobiography that he, he had a writer that wrote with him, but if you read it, I mean, it was a phenomenal book. Right. And I recommend it to everybody, uh, Mike Tyson's story. I enjoyed that a, a whole lot. But I read books all of the time, but the most, the, the majority of them are nonfiction books. Okay. Did you follow this whole Zola story that was happening online? 
this woman that she told her own story like on Twitter and now they're trying to make it into a movie about, do you see anything about that? The only reason why I can say no to that is because when I start writing, I go into a zone. (laughs) So I was writing midnight three. I was in a zone for about a year and a half. And a lot of times I was writing outside of the country. Mm -hmm. So I traveled to a bunch of other countries. So sometimes there's something that was going on right here in the hood. And you miss it. I missed it. Right. (laughs) I missed it. You think Midnight is the ideal man? Or, you know, he's a young, young man. But do you think he's like an ideal? I think Midnight is the man every woman fantasizes about. Uh, But but hardly ever meets. Mm -hmm. Uh, because he is strong but not arrogant, because he is religious but not preachy, he's more just interested in doing what he believes the way that he believes it should be done, but he's not out there preaching to anybody else that they should live a particular way. Uh, Because he has a genuine love for women, and in today's times, Uh, There's a lot of men who don't have a genuine Mm -hmm. love for women because they did not have a good relationship with their own mothers. So if you're a man and you harbor a hatred for your mother or a hatred for the women who raised you because of certain things that happened in your childhood, it's going to be very difficult for you to love genuinely a woman. And I think the key to the Midnight character is that he has a genuine love for his mother and for his people, his sister, and his sister, and that genuine love makes him an excellent lover mm-hmm. of women in general. Yeah. yeah, there's definitely some sex scenes in here as well for everybody. That <laughs> very steamy. I wanted to go back right <laughs> fast to uh, Jesse Jackson and Bill Clinton. Mm. Now, Jesse Jackson made some comments about Barack Obama, and said he I, cut Barack. He wanted to cut, cut Barack's balls off. off. You know? So how did you feel about that? Because we talked about Hillary Clinton talking down to the president, but Jesse Jackson kind of did that as well, talking about cutting his nuts off or whatever the statement that he said. Yeah, I didn't hear uh, Reverend Jackson say that. And the kind of person that I am is that if I didn't hear it and I didn't see it. um, It didn't happen. Because it happened to you. So, you know, that if I didn't hear it and I didn't see it, I don't say it. I don't repeat it and I don't promote it. Gotcha. So I don't really have a comment about that. Now what about it's, it's audio with, of it though. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right. Now what about working with Diddy? How was working with Diddy? Because you you were uh, head of his campaign one time for what was the name of the thing? It was um, Daddy's House Social Program. Daddy's House Social Programs. Let me tell you, um, I met Diddy when he was nineteen. <laughs> um, probably, you know, I was hanging out with Dougie Fresh. <laughs> And Diddy started coming around around that time period. The soldier was clubbing. You was out in the back. Huh? <laughs> no, no, no. Oh. I, I was not clubbing. Okay. I'm, I've never been a club girl. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dougie and I were friends. You know, mm-hmm. we were really good friends. And um, I was a Harlem girl. You know, mm-hmm. I lived uptown, 119th Street, uh, a whole bunch of different places I lived in Harlem. But whatever the case, um, I met Puff around that time that he became friends with Doug. Mm-hmm. And uh, really, I mean, it's a funny story. I was promoting concerts at the Apollo Theater, uh, charity concerts for the homeless children. Mm -hmm. And uh, Diddy wanted to get in business with me. (laughs) And he said, uh, I heard everything about you. I heard you love the kids. He said, and and you're promoting the concerts so that you can take these kids to summer camp. He was like, is that true? And I'm like, yeah, that's definitely true. And he said, uh, well, since you love the kids so much, why don't you focus on the kids and, you know, I will make the money and and you'll be able to use the money for the charitable purpose. Well, at that time, he was 19. I really, you know, I didn't really know him. I mm-hmm. wasn't really up for it. So I declined. Um, and then, you know, time moved on and, and Diddy got really, really big. And I went to a Jodeci concert at the uh, Apollo Theater. Mm-hmm. I was myself and Lauren Hill, we went together. <laughs> and as I walked into the theater, we walked past the bar. Diddy was at the bar. And he said, soldier. He jumped out. Mm-hmm. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, what's happening? And he said, I've been looking for you. I said, you've been looking for me? I mm-hmm. said, really? He said, yeah. He said, I, I made a truck load of money, and I want to give some of it back to the hood but you're the only person that I trust with the money. Wow. Mm. And he, he he wanted to hire me right from there. 
So I went home that night, talked to my husband, and uh, to see if he thought it was all right idea. Right. And my husband said, "Yo, that that cat is large." Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. This is the first time we've ever heard somebody say Diddy gave them. Money. No, it's not. It's, it's it's not. Oh no, this is true story. Word. And 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 let me tell you something. For the years that I worked at Daddy's House Social Programs, mm-hmm. Diddy gave a lot of money, mm-hmm. and we had the most dynamic youth program anywhere and the great thing is that uh from the original camps that i had that was without diddy it inspired so many artists to start their own foundations and their own uh college programs and everything uh and diddy was one of them and so i was i was really grateful to him for that you know, but I wasn't all mixed up in the music game with mm-hmm. Diddy. I ran a charity for him. Right. And, you know, if you ever talk to Diddy personally, he always has an interesting way of phrasing things. You know, if I said anything about music or anything about the artist or anything about the direction of anything, he would say, listen, soldier. That's not the kind of marriage we have. <laughs> <laughs> well, you run the charity. <laughs> now, what charity do you have now that if people want to, to, to support and, and donate, they can? I don't have a charity right now. Actually, I've just been full-time mm-hmm. writing mm-hmm. books and films. Um, but I do think that every big artist, entertainer, athlete should have a charity or a foundation because Really, uh, what Diddy and I had is really what you need. You need Mm -hmm. a person who is a a, a, a everyday, practical, knowledgeable person to run it. And then you need the money man, somebody like Diddy, to support it. I don't think one person could do both sides. So, you know, if Diddy wanted to do it again or Mm -hmm. another big entertainer athlete wanted to do it again, I know exactly how it's done. I write the curriculums, run the programs, everything. I'm always open for that. But right now, I don't have that kind of thing going on. Okay. Well, we appreciate you. Well, joining congratulations! Us. I can't wait to finish so this j- book. You know where I'll be at tonight and tomorrow and the night after that. So, well, appreciate thank you very it. much. And I just want to invite uh, people out to my book signing. Mm-hmm. I'm at NYU Books tomorrow night. Uh, let me see. Let me correct myself. I'm at NYU Books on Tuesday, November 10th there you go. at 6 p.m. There you right. go. Are <laughs> <laughs> people invited out Wednesday to um, NJ Pack for that? NJ is Pack is by invitation only. Okay. That's uh, You're not invited hosted you. by the mayor of Newark, Raz, Raz Baraka. Baraka. Actually, yeah, I will be there, MV, okay? Uh, and let me just I say, Raz the Baraka, the mayor, used to be a camp counselor with our charitable camps <laughs> from there the beginning, wow. from before Diddy and during Diddy. That's full circle. Yeah, That's so right what would happen is I call him up and say, listen, we need 100 kids from Newark. I got 125 kids from New York, and we're going to take these 225 kids to this camp. And the first one that we had was in uh, North Carolina, but the the children were all from New York and New Jersey. So that's how far back Mayor Ras Baraka and I go again. And he went to school with Diddy. Right. Mm -hmm. So all of us was in the same mix. Same mix together. Wow. See, great to have that army of people around you. There. Right, it was amazing I, because you mm-hmm. know we everybody used to say what they was gonna be when they when they got older. Diddy used to say, Diddy used to say, I'm gonna be a a, a record producer. <laughs> I'm gonna be the number one artist. I'm gonna own a radio station. He used to say, and we used to laugh. We right. thought it was funny. You <laughs> now know? he has revolt. He has revolt. Raz used to say, I'm gonna be the mayor of Newark. Wow. He's been wow. saying that since he was 19. That's years. why wow. you got to speak it into wow. fruition. That's right. All so right. it's been a long time. All right. Well, we and appreciate we you for joining us again. Thank you very Sister much. Sister Soldier, it's Thank the Breakfast Club. Good me. morning.